Uh, so thanks for being here. Uh, our guest tonight, folks, is Scott Linscombe, a senior fellow in economic studies at the Cato Institute, uh, where he writes on international and domestic economic issues, including environmental, or rather international trade, subsidies and industrial policy, uh, and economic dynamism generally. Uh, senior visiting lecturer at Duke University School of Law, where he taught on international trade law. Um, prior to joining Cato, he spent two decades practicing international trade law at White and Case, a uh, big law firm. Uh, where he litigated national and multi multilateral trade disputes and advised multinational corporations on how to optimize their transactions and business practices. This is big. This is big stuff, folks. Sorry, um, <laughs> a little long and pretentious. But, you know. And um, uh, he's been uh, he's been uh, with Cato for some time now. Uh, he's been featured on TV, radio, and print media. Uh, Scott, how are you doing today? Doing well. How are you? Doing quite well. Thanks for being here today. Sure. Um, you know, uh, what's interesting, I guess, about the trade issue is that uh, something I was talking about is we often debate this issue on on uh, our stream when we have, you know, just kind of our you know conservative versus liberal type debates. And the dynamics have really changed on it uh, in terms of, uh, I guess, skepticism with trade. It seems like uh, uh, there's a lot of skepticism with trade from all corners these days. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And... Um, I guess I want to I want to uh, start off by saying that generally uh, I'm I'm sold on a lot of these arguments, but I want to try and push uh, on some of them. Um, nevertheless, in talking with you tonight to see what you think. Okay. So the first thing I'm curious about is you know I'm thinking about American history writ large. Uh, I learned recently that the first law we passed in this country after we enacted our Constitution was the Tariff Act of 1789. Yes. So the first thing we we put into into law was a tariff. Uh, and not just to raise money, but to protect industry. And right. that from that period until 1912, 1913, the federal government was funded, I think, except for a brief period during the Civil War, almost exclusively tariffs. And these tariffs yeah. were very high at times. Nevertheless, the U.S. became uh, the world's foremost industrial power during that period of time, from a little strip of land on the edge of the world to the center of the world economy. So... You know, what's so bad about tariffs if they turned us from an, an agricultural backwater into a into an economic superpower? Right. Well, well, first, uh, the, the, there's a false premise in your question. And fact is, so um, backstory here is um, for those who care. Uh, I wrote a pretty detailed paper on the history of American protectionism uh, a couple years ago. So 2017, big, fat, long uh, paper that. I don't know, it serves a, a nice book stop or doorstop for people um, or, or a good night uh, bedtime reading. But um, so this is all put put to bed in that paper, but I'll give you the Cliffs notes. Um, first is the faulty premise that the United States actually rose to manufacturing prominence, uh, industrial prominence via protectionism. Mm -hmm. Um, the fact is that there have been a, a lot of really good, thorough, rigorous academic studies that show that the, the United States actually uh, grew despite, because of the tariffs. So what these guys did is they actually looked at the industries that actually benefited from real tariff protection, because like you said, um, these were also used to raise revenue. and and. Um, and I'll, I'll pause there, but say that you, you can't have a revenue raising tariff that's too high because, of course, it'll just block all the imports and then you won't raise any money. Right. So um, there were two types of tariffs, protective tariffs and, and the revenue raising type. And they looked. So these econ economists looked at the revenue raise or that, excuse me, the protectionist type and realized, wow, the sectors that benefited really didn't actually do better than other sectors. And in fact, in some cases, they did worse. And instead, what really drove the United States economic performance over that time were non-trade issues, in particular, massive amounts of immigration and uh, essentially the expansion of domestic trade through railroads and the rest. So, so that was, uh, again, I think it's, uh, it's actually a false premise um, that it, it, it wasn't the United States did not rise to power because of protectionism. But the second issue is that um, really a lot of what happened in the 1800s and in the 1900s with respect to U.S. tariffs and U.S. tariff policy is utterly inapposite, uh, so inapplicable um, to today. 
Mm-hmm. And there's two big reasons for that. One, on the revenue raising side, um, there simply isn't enough revenue out there to be generated via tariffs. Um, like I said before, I mean, you know, back then the U.S. budget was tiny. We didn't have any entitlements. Um, you know, defense spending was tiny, and there was a you could you could actually raise enough revenue through tariffs. Well, today that's just simply not the case. The budget is massive. We have all these programs for better or worse. And again, you run into the problem of we just don't trade enough to have um, low tariffs that would raise revenue. Again, because if you have a bunch of 100% tariffs, well, guess what? You're actually um, not going to be raising a lot of revenue, right? So the the second thing, though, is that, um, look, the nature of the U.S. economy is just utterly different. And it's not just simply in terms of agriculture, but it's really in terms of manufacturing. Um, And the evolution of global supply chains and such that different countries make different things and goods or have inputs from all over the world really renders this kind of old school protectionism where you could establish a tariff on a, a widget and because all of the stuff that went into that widget Um, was produced in the United States, you could actually create some sort of economic benefit. Well, these days, because global, uh, a lot of raw materials and commodities and parts are globally traded and and these kind of uh, commodity products like steel and the rest, you impose a tariff on an upstream input and you end up hurting the downstream manufacturer. um, And so you really can't use protectionism in the way that you could um, in the days of kind of these massive vertically integrated conglomerates. So because of that, really, that 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 argument, which is quite common, um, is it doesn't really work very well. And then the last thing I would just note, as I argue, in, as I discuss in the paper, is we actually now have a ton of history and analysis about the effects of protectionism after that golden era. And we can see quite plainly that it just doesn't work very well. It imposes really high consumer costs. It doesn't really breed uh, a thriving domestic industry. You end up with these kind of moribund zombie industries. Mm. Um, And at the end of the day, it also encourages tons of political corruption which was very evident in the tariff policy of the 1800s, where tariff policy was really the most corrupt area of U.S. policy. Really? Now, I, oh, it, yeah. out of curiosity, I, I haven't, um, I, I had some, I wanted to ask you about the political side of tariffs, um, yeah. but could you, I hadn't thought much about the corruption side of tariffs. Could you oh, talk yeah, about that no, for a minute? It's, so it's, there, there are um, a guy named Tausig, T-A-U-S-S-I-G, uh-huh. who wrote a tariff history of the United States, one of these kind of authoritative, contemporaneous looks at tariff policy back in the 1800s, mm-hmm. talked about how um, in Congress was just ha- uh, really hilariously, in retrospect, corrupt with respect to tariff policy. Huh. Essentially, politicians handing out tariffs, because remember, tariff policy back then was, was controlled by Congress as mm-hmm. it's dictated under the Constitution. And these guys just went around and, and they were implementing tariffs and trading them um, to benefit a political benefactors. And so, again, if you look at my paper, I quote from that. Um, and there's, so there's a lot of evidence that modern lobbying that we think of and lobbying and rent seeking the rest uh, arose out of U.S. tariff policy. If you don't like K Street, if you think there's too much of that type of cronyism and the government, wow. you can thank U.S. tariff policy for getting us started. That's where it all begins. Yeah. Wow. It. That is so. Like I, the reason it's so interesting was that I didn't know prior to researching for this that our first, like our first federal law was a tariff right. restriction, and then the origin of the lobbying that people complain about yeah. all the time. Yeah. I mean, I guess it makes sense, right? Because this is, a, yeah, right. you know, such a basic pocketbook issue, but wow. Um, now, something else you said that I'm uh, curious about. You said, I think just now, it sounded like you were placing emphasis on Congress handling it at the time. Now, yeah. that has changed somewhat in the sense right. that it seems that now Congress has delegated, I don't know about all, but a massive part of its authority right. for uh, slapping mm-hmm. tariffs, uh, you know, to use a technical term, to the president. Um, yeah. Is that is that uh, is that uh, all the case? Are there any tariffs that are beyond, I guess, the president's control? Or, <laughs> well, we before Trump, we thought yes, mm-hmm. there were, but he has, um, for better or worse, taken advantage of the laws that you mentioned, mm-hmm. um, some of which hadn't been used in decades. Um, and some of which are so broad and ambiguous, particularly in the national security side, 
that uh, the president could essentially uh, slap tariffs on almost anything on national security grounds. Now, he'd need to have an investigation and so forth. But look, we saw in the, in the case of steel and aluminum mm -hmm. that uh, the president's uh, tariffs really didn't need much of a legitimate justification. I'm actually writing a new paper on national security and trade right now. And if you look at the steel case in particular, I mean, American steel producers had 70 percent market share um, before the tariffs were implemented. They were profitable. They had steady output or um, profitable. And, and yet they won this massive amount of new tariff protection. Subsequently, that's been challenged in court, and the Department of Justice has argued with a straight face in response to questions from judges at the Court of International Trade <laughs> that the president could, if he found a national security threat, put tariffs on peanut butter. So, and and unfortunately, the Supreme Court denied cert in that case. So that that law stands as a constitutional delegation of the, of Congress's trade powers. And so, yeah, I mean, we really are in a in a from a free trade perspective, from a separation of powers perspective in kind of a bad place with respect to these policies. Because like you mentioned, Congress over the last hundred years has delegated wide swaths of its tariff powder to the president. And they did so on, in retrospect, naive uh, grounds. They mm -hmm. thinking that the president having a national constituency would be the least protectionist guy in government because <laughs> everybody else has more insular right. domestic political constituencies. You know, Marco wow. Rubio likes to protect the sugar industry. Yeah. Um, you know, there are folks here in North Carolina that love the textile industry and mm -hmm. so forth and so on. Right. So they thought the president was going to be a free trader. And and so they dealt they passed these laws thinking, well, Look, Smoot Hawley was a debacle. It was this economic calamity that that uh, that deepened the Great Depression. It was also, again, pretty corrupt. Those in are the, how it was the all massive implemented. tariffs. Uh, implement, sorry, sorry. Those are the massive tariffs implemented right after the stock market crash, right? Yeah, right, and right, kind of in the middle of the Great Depression. And and uh, economists pretty uniformly say, look, they didn't cause the Great Depression, but they definitely deepened it. And so. After Smoot Hawley, Congress said, "Look, we can't be trusted with this power. Let's give it to the president." <laughs> and and they had some basis for this, not just on the practical side, but look, trade agreements in particular are an exercise of the president's foreign affairs powers. And the president is the head of state mm -hmm. through the Department of State, through the United States Trade Representative. That's what the executive branch is supposed to do. So there was some justification for this, but Congress over the last hundred years has gotten way out over its skis on this. And uh, unfortunately, efforts to kind of claw back some of this power have failed miserably because our Congress doesn't want any actual responsibility or authority. And so there really hasn't been any any serious effort to do that. And, you know, this doesn't need to be that Congress setting tariff rates again. I mean, I mm -hmm. think that would be a, a, a kind of a bit of a disaster. Really? But it could be something as simple as, uh, you know, I mentioned this section, this national security law, not letting those tariffs enter into force until, con until Congress affirmatively approves them uh -huh. via a vote. Be a pretty easy thing to do, right? No, uh, and there's been legislation put forth in that regard by uh, Senator Mike Lee, and it has gone absolutely nowhere. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, that's that's where we are. Wow. So, like advice and consent, but for tariffs. Yeah, Basically. and the the, the yeah. silliest part of this is that Congress has retained tariff power when it comes to liberalizing tariffs. I mean, that tells you kind of how messed up our system is right now. So when the United States enters into a free trade agreement with another mm -hmm. country, that free trade agreement doesn't simply get implemented in the United States. Right. It has to be passed by Congress, by both chambers of Congress, and it's an exercise of their constitutional power. Mm -hmm. So the president can't just unilaterally liberalize and, and lower tariffs, but he can unilaterally raise them. And wow. Mike Lee's whole point was, look, as an it's it's a valid exercise of Section One powers to have a balance in this regard. And nonsensical not to have it in nonsensical times. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, wow, that's really interesting. I hadn't heard about that proposal, but I mean, that would make a lot of sense because it seems like Congress has delegated so much power that, you know, they're no longer right. really an active participant. Well, and, you, and you think about some of the threats that Trump has made, mm -hmm. 
for example, with respect to auto tariffs. He wanted to put a bunch of tariffs on cars, and they had another national security investigation that resulted in a secret report. We still haven't seen it. There's a report somewhere hiding in the Department of Commerce that says that imports of automobiles, so Ford Festivas from Mexico, Mercedes-Benz, Germany, are a national security threat. Now, this is, is insane, but that is the finding of the Department <laughs> of Commerce. So Congress has pretty uniformly, I mean, a wide bipartisan uh, group of Congress has said, this is crazy. You're going to crash the economy. Yeah. You're going to hurt a bunch of industries. You know, for example, BMW has a big plant in South Carolina. There's Korean uh, automakers in the deep South, um, Volkswagen in Tennessee. I could go on and on. Um, and then, of course, Honda and Nissan and the rest in the, rest, in, in the, in the industrial Midwest. So... <clears throat> um, Congress has said, this is crazy. And yet, again, they, they're really powerless to stop it. Um, and But the president has held off on that. I think the economic effects, um, finally somebody uh, up there got through to him that this would be an economic <laughs> calamity and, and be kind of ridiculous. Um, so they have held off on that. But again, there's this secret report hanging out somewhere saying that, that the president could could do it. On national security grounds, wow. Yeah, was, national was, security. It was terrifying German cars. Wow. Right. Well, yeah. you know, so let me let me ask you uh, uh, something else here. Um, you know, it's it's all well and good to talk about how uh, trade benefits people, um, but you know, I was I was reading uh, in advance of this uh, interview a little discussion from a uh, professor uh, at uh, I think George Washington University named Adam Dean, who wrote a piece in the Washington Post where he said, in a recently published study, my co-author and I found that trade-related job losses are closely related to spikes in opioid-related overdose deaths. Yeah. Less educated males in Appalachia are bearing the brunt of free trade, as well as the opioid epidemic. Young people are looking for ways out of communities hurt by trade. Enlistment in the army is surging in these communities. And it's not just that youth are more willing to enlist after trade shocks. The military is apparently recruiting these communities. He's also said... That since 2000, um, which I believe is the year or near the time where uh, China enters the World Trade yeah. Organization, um, and then ten uh, about uh, you know, the better part of a decade after NAFTA, since 2000, more than 60,000 U.S. factories have closed as import competition and outsourcing eliminated more than two million well-paid industrial yeah. jobs. Um, so it's it's all well and good to talk about right. uh, costs uh, and benefits, you know, on a balance sheet. But you 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 uh, I think you know you let slip a moment ago. You know, we don't really call it the industrial Midwest much anymore, right? It's the Rust Belt. Um, it, this is an area of the country that's been hit hard by trade, has it not? I mean, um, yes and no. So, so I'll start with. So, I wrote another mm -hmm. paper that actually just came out this year on the China shock that you yes. mentioned, and and I think that 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 um, op-ed you mentioned is mm -hmm. a really fantastic example of just how bad the oh. actual debate on the China shock is. Yeah. Because the China shock literature actually said the following, that looking at only the impact of Chinese imports on uh, these commuting zones, these areas, there was a net loss, according to these guys, of 2.4 million jobs. However, that was the quote, upper bound of their estimate. Hmm. However, that included only 1 million manufacturing jobs, give or take. Really? How, that also occurred over a 12-year period, thus meaning that the manufacturing jobs lost per year were a tiny fraction of total manufacturing jobs lost over the entire period due to automation and productivity and changing consumer tastes and the rest. Moreover, there have been a slew of studies since the original China shock studies came out. And these showed the following things. They showed ample economic benefits, not just for American consumers, but for a lot of American manufacturers and for a lot of American jobs. They found that the industries that had, were hardest hit by the China shock were really on their way out of the country anyway. And so the China shock was not, it's not like these industries were thriving, they were doing wonderfully, and then all of a sudden Chinese imports arrived. Turns out that these industries had kind of moved from the Northeast, they had settled in the South or in the industrial Midwest, 
They were really kind of struggling and barely hanging on. And the China shock was kind of just the last push over the edge. So again, this was a slow decline that was maybe just hastened a bit by uh, the rise of Chinese imports. Other studies have found that overall, the United States economy had net benefits, overall net benefits, that yes, there were these discrete regional harms, but the economy as a whole benefited from, from China's entry. Others challenge the whole premise of the China shock. They say, look, these guys did a, a partial uh, reduced form economic analysis. But again, when you broaden it out and you look at all these other things, again, there was a an actual, there were increasing jobs in, for example, in exports, so benefiting American manufacturers, increasing jobs in services. Um, there were all sorts of other economic effects. And, and this, I think, and then I would say last, um, Economists have said, well, you know, Chinese imports actually over over a longer period, so from about 1990 to 2017, <clears throat> you see that Chinese imports did did less to actually displace um, American products, American manufacturers, and did more to actually replace other Asian imports. In, t oh. in other words, so the share of Asian imports into the United States was actually relatively steady between 1990 and 2017. It's just that China's share of that share increased dramatically. Like and thus Japan, indicating Taiwan, important. South Korea? Japan, Taiwan, exactly. Huh. Thus indicating that China was doing more to compete with those exporters than with, with US manufacturers. Now look, that doesn't mean that Chinese imports didn't um, displace some jobs in the United States. That means that there wasn't, uh, that's what, but, but that's what, competition and free market economics do um, you know when a when a manufacturer in South Carolina um, opens up a new plant and takes jobs from Ohio um, that's the, the same type of competition all sorts of economic activity in the free market create and destroy jobs and as I was getting at before the, sh the actual share of jobs destroyed by supposedly Chinese imports, even if you accept the China shock literature as gospel, mm -hmm. it was a tiny share of the total number of jobs destroyed over that 12 year period. And again, destroyed by all sorts of market activity and what we normally think of as creative destruction. Mm -hmm. um, this type of stuff goes on all of the time and it, it turns out that in, in, it's a net benefit. We, we end up trading low skill, low wage textile jobs for higher skill, higher wage jobs, either in advanced manufacturing, so aerospace, satellites, motor vehicles, or in services. And that's really, again, part of, so Chinese imports are a, a small share of that. Now, all of these studies that then extrapolate from that and tie it to opioid abuse and the rest, um, if you look at what the studies actually say, however, is again, that China's, Chinese imports are a tiny and pl only plausible driver yeah. of these broader social trends. And I think quite frankly, it does the people in these places a real disservice to claim that all of their ills have been caused by Chinese imports and that if only we had blocked Chinese imports, everything would be fine. Because we know again uh, that that's just simply not true. We have, there's tons of evidence and experience that shows that when you block imports from one country, imports from another country pop up and they really have the same effects overall. We tried to block Chinese tires a few years ago under the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. They were simply replaced by Brazilian tires and Thai <laughs> tires and didn't actually help workers. So it's, I think it's really a lot of economic snake oil for, yeah. for guys like you mentioned in the, in the Washington Post mm -hmm. to really imply that these communities would have been simply better off and uh, if they had just blocked Chinese imports. And I think it also lets American policymakers, CEOs, union reps, and the rest off the hook for a lot of the really awful policies they've implemented over the last 20 plus years, whether it's with respect to tax policy, occupational licensing, or criminal justice reform, or the war on terror, or, or you know, so forth and so on and so on, right? And, and just by saying, oh, it's all China's fault, it really lets those <laughs> folks off the hook. Um, and that's, I think, a real shame.
Well, China is something I wanted to talk about in a uh, in a couple of dimensions. One, in the sense of uh, the harm, uh, if any. Um, I mean, it sounds like, you know, to put it short, uh, your position is that we have benefited as a country far more than we have lost out in trade in the sense of trading with China. Right. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. I would say this, that Chinese imports cause discrete harms to certain individuals in certain communities. Mm -hmm. um, overall, they produce net economic benefits and they produce benefits through a process meaning free trade and free markets that would be uh, that was been enormously beneficial mm -hmm. and that um, it's really counterproductive to try to isolate a single country or a single event um, because doing so not only again scapegoats a lot of other bad policies mm -hmm. but also lets people then call into question the broader system whether it's freer trade or freer mm -hmm. markets more broadly yeah. and we see that all of the time actually there's kind of this China, the China boogeyman mm -hmm. is really the kind of toe in the door for more <laughs> economic interventionism. Yeah. You know, we just gave out billions of dollars in subsidies to the American semiconductor industry, which, by the way, is profitable and thriving. And we did it because of a, a supposedly because of China. Well, if you actually ask uh, reputable sources like the U.S. International Trade Commission, uh, Chinese semiconductor industry is not a threat, mm -hmm. but it became a perfect vehicle for Congress to fast track a bunch of corporate welfare to the semiconductor industry. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, again, the big problem here isn't China. China is doing bad stuff. Chinese trade did have some harness for some people. But when you start allowing these types of arguments to kind of become pervasive, then you open the door to broader interventions, bar more protectionism, more subsidies and the rest. And those we know from tons of experience don't work out very well. Well, in the, and I think um, uh, you may be uh, referencing, I think you just wrote a piece called Conservative Industrial Policy and the China Threat, right? Yeah. About the semiconductors. And I like the uh, the piece, at the part at the end where you said all too often, even or especially in the case of national security in China or Japan before it, ideas that sound good and necessary on paper are revealed upon closer inspection to be corporatist giveaways that counter imaginary threats that end up doing more harm than good. Yeah. And it certainly seems like in retrospect, for example, when we think about Japan, I know, you know, I didn't I didn't live through it, but it seems like it would have been an interesting time to, uh, you know, that fear of Japan as the future number one, right? Right, um, yeah. And that turned out to be kind of ephemeral, but um, I know what you just said about, uh, you know, we don't want to isolate China as a boogeyman. I guess it does seem to me that there is something about China that is a little different from thinking about Japan, not yeah. j or any other really country in the world. Not just the size of China relative to any other potential competitor, but the fact that China is doing discrete harms, not just like in an economic sense to, uh, you know, those American workers who lose jobs, um, you know, e even though America benefits as a whole, but to, uh, to its own people. Like when, for example, China prospers sure. and the Chinese right. government has more resources to then spend on programs like its massive program of re-education, uh, yeah. imprisonment, internment, concentration camps in East Turkestan right now with the Uyghur Muslims. When somebody tells me, look, Bassett, I may even agree with you that trade is a good thing. Uh, they will often follow up with, but uh, here's, where, here's where you lose me. You want to send money to a country that is not only our geopolitical foe, but which is, in effect, a, a uh, fascist police state. Right. Um, how are you not helping that uh, fascist police state to be a fascist police state by sending money over there? Right. Okay. So there's there's two big problems with that argument, and and let me start by saying uh, there is nothing I I, I don't oppose uh, unilateral sanctions against bad actors, and the United mm -hmm. States has done some of that. Where look, if you find out certain government officials are involved in these uh, Uyghur uh, facilities, um, yeah, I mean sanction those individuals. That's totally fine, but when you apply broad tariffs and when you try to decouple the economies um, to the extent that's even possible, you, you really need to ask two big questions. One is, would China have developed if the United States had these tariffs in place 20 plus years ago? The answer is pretty unequivocally yes, they would have. That simply denying permanent normal trade relations with China or trying to deny China's entry to the WTO to the extent that was even realistic in the 90s was not going to stop China's rise overall. And there's all sorts of 
very complicated reasons for that. But and again, I, they're they're fully uh, discussed in my paper. But the main point is that the the global economy it's like pushing on a water balloon, right? You push one place and another place pops out. Well, and that's what happens with a lot of trade. Where if if trade if the United States had high tariffs on Chinese imports at the time, well, we'd import more from Vietnam, but it would have Chinese content. China would of course still continue to trade with all the other countries that at the time in the 1990s wanted to trade with China, whether it's the Europeans or South American, whatever. So, so we were not single-handedly going to deny China's rise, and in fact, um, we would have lost out on uh, our own economic benefits, our own geopolitical benefits in other areas, whether it's North Korea or Iran or the rest. So that's the first problem. The second problem is you have to ask if today cutting off trade actually would achieve the policies we want to achieve. And in that sense, we know from a lot of experience that first, tariffs are a horrible policy for achieving foreign policy or human rights um, hmm. uh, objectives. Mm -hmm. So it, it, unilaterally in particular. So it's very unlikely that the United States can achieve um, what we want. Um, freeing the Uyghurs and the rest, whatever, yeah. uh, you know, freeing Hong Kong, all of these things via tariffs. So, so it's it's emotionally satisfying, but it doesn't actually work. It, in fact, can actually embolden hardliners in the Chinese government and elsewhere, because it looks like a direct frontal attack, not again on specific government actors, but on the Chinese people, on the entire country. And again, there's some evidence of that, where Trump's tariffs have actually emboldened hardliners in China's government. They've actually uh, empowered state-owned enterprises versus private companies, and they've done more harm than good. Um, at the same time, you're weakening the United States economy. Um, there's ample evidence that Trump's tariffs hurt the American manufacturing sector. So again, you have to step back, put the emotion aside and ask, well, what's the best policy to achieve these very laudable foreign policy or human rights objectives? And time and time again, it just shows that these kind of unilateral, broad-based, indiscriminate tariffs don't work. Can I, 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 I'm not sure if this is, um, you know, since you mentioned that, I'm curious what you might think of some historical kind of examples yeah. Like, for example, uh, and again, if this is, you know, uh, kind of beyond the pale of what you're interested in, you know, feel free to let me know. But I'm curious now, like, um, when you, you say that these broad-based um, responses don't work, uh, yeah. I guess I'm thinking about, like, for example, when we embargoed Japan, uh, we embargoed oil to Japan. Like, an embargo, I mean, it's, I guess it's a little different. People consider that to be an act of war as opposed to a tariff or a trade restriction. But is it your position that economic responses, um, like sanctions, uh, broad broad based sanctions, maybe don't even really work? No, I think that. So my my response is first, you have to consider what the United States is actually willing to do on mm. in turn. And so and and like you said, there are there are certain things that would be complete, you know, acts of war. But the second is the difference between a unilateral action and a multilateral action. Right. On the unilateral front, there are fewer things that the United States can do effectively on a very broad scale. And that again gets to kind of the tariff issue. Um, we, the United States can be pretty effective in terms of unilateral actions and financial markets, but you actually see the Chinese right now moving to buffer themselves from those types of actions by trading more in euros or in yuan and less in dollars. So they can actually try to evade U.S. financial restrictions. But more generally, we see throughout history that and, and unilateral sanctions were really popular in the 90s, and the United States government moved away from them because they were routinely found to not be very effective. So what about if the United States joined a sort of, um, you know, a, a sort of coalition of uh, partners that were located in the Pacific? Yeah. You know, and then decided, all right, uh, you know, we're going to get, you know, we're going to get, we're going to get together. Maybe we'll call it the Trans-Pacific Partnership, you know, just for fun. Suppose we all get together and then we decide, okay, you know what? Uh, we have had enough of this uh, rising, you know, rising uh, uh, police state, you know, and it's uh, aggressive uh, designs for total control of its own population. Uh, we do not want to uh, trade uh, as a block 
anymore, or we're going to impose some restrictions as a block. Do you think there could be some uh, potential to that causing uh, political change? I, it, I, it strikes me as highly unlikely given mm. the size of China's economy and the mm. willingness. I think the other thing that's really important, and this is, it's a very American thing to yeah. think that we can single-handedly foment broad-based regime change of some mm. sort. I mean, didn't, you know, we, we have some recent experience with regime change. It, it didn't work so great. Right. Um, but of course, and those were in very small countries. To do that with a country with nuclear warheads, uh, a ma the second largest economy in the world, yeah. 1.3 billion people, a very large military, mm -hmm. um, it's a very different thing. Mm -hmm. It's also, I think, uh, pretty unrealistic to, to think that these countries would just automatically choose the United States over China. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was in Korea about, I don't know, now about a year and a half ago. And I was, uh, it was the first time I had been there in, in like a decade. And I was really taken aback by just how pervasive the Chinese language and Chinese influence is in South Korea. Now, South mm. Korea is an ally. They are a free trade agreement partner. But due to simple economic gravity, China is extremely influential there. And so, you know, I think we have to, ask what if we were hey we we're forcing you to choose mm -hmm. what would really be the choice and i don't know the answer to that mm -hmm. um you know and and i think that's that's a a a, a problem however you raised the trans-pacific partnership and that's a great example of the things the united states can do a a free trade agreement with a bunch of countries in the asia pacific a coalition of the willing of sorts to provide those countries with an alternative market um, and saying, look, we're going to give you duty free access to the U.S. market and we will have duty free access to your market. We're going to try to uh, tighten up and further integrate our supply chains and kind of wean you off the Chinese market. That's a really valuable and good thing. Um, and yet, uh, you know, we abandoned it on day one of the Trump administration. Do you think that in a... Um... I guess uh, in a Biden administration, there might be any hope for uh, you know a second look at the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I think so. Eventually, I think Biden's mm -hmm. been pretty clear that they're not doing any trade stuff early on. Yeah. But you know, presidents typically change their tune on trade once they get elected. Trump, Trump's actually um, the exception to the rule. Um, he said he was going to be a raving protectionist, and he's been pretty darn protectionist. Yeah. Um, I promise is kept, uh, <laughs> but most most presidents tone it down a lot because yeah. they 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 get into the Oval Office, they realize the not just economic issues but the foreign policy and geopolitical issues, and they realize okay you know what I really can't for example uh, you know uh, unwind NAFTA yeah. or uh, start a trade war with Europe. Trump didn't do that, and I think we've seen some of the foreign policy ramifications of that. Mm -hmm. Hmm. You know, one, one more question on this point. Um, even if we just to try and kind of fully push this, this issue, um, even if we can't uh, topple, I suppose, a, a brutal regime, do you think there's any... Um, oh, uh, yeah, sure. Got it. Uh, do you think there's any kind of um, obligation uh, by a country to, uh, or for a country to... Uh, implement trade policy in such a way that it, you know, like, do you think a country should try to consider humanitarian goals in its trade policy? Or is it just not a good vehicle generally? Yeah. Um, well, so it, it's not a good vehicle generally, except, um, look, there's, there's a ton of evidence that shows that freer trade and trade generally has mm -hmm. lifted, you know, millions and billions of people yeah. out of poverty. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you worry about things like child labor, if you worry about things like human trafficking and all of these things, then there's a great role to play for mm -hmm. globalization, whether it's trade or immigration, in terms of improving human rights around the world. On the other hand, using trade as a cudgel to force human rights changes is very difficult. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, South Africa and apartheid mm 
is a bit of an example of where it, it can do some good, but that was a really multilateral effort. Mm -hmm. And you need a very large coalition of willing economic actors to have it work. And mm -hmm. it's just, we just don't have that with China. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have it, yeah, when we don't have that type of coalition, it, it's pretty tough. Okay. Let me, um, let me ask you here real quick. I know you said you have to hop off. Um, the message uh, showed up on the screen, so everybody else oh. does too. Um, do you have uh, five minutes more maybe? Yeah, sure. Okay, all right. Um, so that uh, brings me to the last two questions I want to ask you here about trade, kind of from a skeptical uh, sort of perspective here. So first of all, when you one other thing you're doing, I suppose, when you're trading abroad is you are, especially with respect to China, if you don't want to deal with a union, uh, you don't have to deal with a union in China. If you don't want to deal, you know, they, they have a state trade union, right. which is to say there are no unions in China. They have, um, you know, they have laxer environmental standards, even if they've come a little farther from where they were. Do you think uh, that uh, trade agreements should consider labor standards and environmental standards? I know Elizabeth Warren called for that during right. the campaign. I haven't heard much about it since then. But um, I, what do you think about, about the role of labor and environmental considerations in trade deals? Yeah, I'm, I'm generally skeptical of them for, for two big reasons. Mm -hmm. One is that, like I just said, freer trade tends to help economic development. As countries develop, they tend to get cleaner. They tend to have better labor rights. You see, again, child labor has declined dramatically. The, the ILO, uh, International Labor Organization, had actually a wonderful report about a year ago, which is some stunning stats on child labor, on human trafficking and the rest. And they were very frank. They said, mm -hmm. look, a lot of this is, is, is because of trade and globalization. And so threatening to cut off trade, um, it, it actually, you know, it's cutting off your nose to spite your face, right? Yeah. You're really, you're actually throwing away a ladder that these countries and these people have to climb out of abject poverty and to improve, again, tr uh, environmental and labor rights. Now, yeah. is it a magic bullet? No, of course not. But it does mm -hmm. tend to help over, over a longer period. Um, but the other reason is because uh, these provisions are often become just backdoors to protectionism. Mm -hmm. So you look at, for example, the new rules that are in the USMCA, the, the NAFTA replacement, and you see that it's, a, it's going to allow U.S. labor unions to block imports from Mexico based solely on allegations of unfair labor practices. So, so you can, and we see in the past that labor and environmental uh, rules become excuses. They become yeah. really disguised restrictions on international trade um, and disguised protectionism. So uh, I, again, I, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical of that. I will say that as a compromise about 10 years ago, Democrats and Republicans put in uh, provisions that simply said at the time they wouldn't allow for backsliding. So mm -hmm. a trade agreement partner could not loosen its environmental and labor rules mm -hmm. to attract new capital. That strikes me as pretty harmless and fine. But when you start having proactive measures, allowing, yeah. again, private parties to sue to block imports on labor grounds, mm -hmm. environmental grounds, that, I think, uh, raises a bunch of problems. Okay. And, um, and that's, that's kind of what I was, I was thinking, but at the same time, it's such a, it's one of those issues that like a lot of trade issues, rhetorically, it sounds so good, but in right. practice, it sounds like it's not so good. My yeah. Last... And the race, to, the, the whole race to the bottom thing is a bit of a myth. Um, mm. I mean, certainly there are examples of countries, uh, attracting, uh, multinational corporations due to lax environmental or regulatory policy. But in general, it just doesn't happen. Multinationals locate in certain places for a host of reasons. Mm -hmm. They're simply not going to pick up and invest billions of dollars because, you know, they might be able to dump, you know, they might be able to pollute in a river or something. Yeah. Um, it's a far more complex calculus. Okay. And uh, for our last minute here, I just wanted to ask, what are some adjustment policies for trade deals that have worked? I've heard, for example, about trade adjustment insurance but it never, it seems like an idea that never really got off the ground. Um. Yeah, well, so TAA, Trade Adjustment Assistance, actually 
um, has been a part of every trade agreement dating back, I think, to NAFTA. Mm -hmm. um, the the problem with TAA, and it's very generous. I mean, mm -hmm. really generous. Oh wow. Um, the problem with TAA, however, is that if you look at the studies that have tracked workers who w went into TAA programs, they actually have not done very well. Um, so it's actually proven to be a pretty ineffective program, and it's pretty costly for what it does. Um, I mean, in my view, I think. U.S. adjustment assistance should be far broader based. There shouldn't be any sort of trade hook to it. Um, you know, it makes trade sound uniquely bad. Mm -hmm. Studies actually show that technology shocks are far deeper and more painful than yeah. trade shocks for, you know, in general. Yeah. Um, China shock notwithstanding. And so, you know, why have an adjustment assistance program that's tied specifically to trade? Mm -hmm. um, but you know, as I alluded to earlier, I think that the the federal government and state and local governments over the last 20 years or so have done all sorts of things to actually inhibit adjustment. You know, whether it's housing policy or occupational licensing policy or drug policy or the rest, there are all sorts of things that actually prevent workers from moving on or from saving um, when disaster strikes. And that, I think, is just as important, if not more so, than any sort of proactive government adjustment assistance program. Right on. Well, um, Scott, thank you so much for your time. I know you, you said you got to head out. Um, folks, uh, uh, Scott Linscombe from the Cato Institute, I hope you, uh, you uh, enjoyed the chat. Maybe we can do it again sometime. My pleasure. Right. Sure. Thank you. Take care. Have a good one.